my name is Katie Giro, and I'm excited to present our work on mental models of AI agents. This is work that I did while I was interning at IBM last summer, and I was part of a really big and amazing team, so I just want to thank, take a moment to thank everyone who contributed to this work and just point out that I'm presenting uh, on behalf of a lot of different people. So we are really interested in mental models of AI agents. Mental models are essentially the way that individuals think systems work. So they're often studied in science education, where the student has a mental model of the thing that they're studying, for instance, the atom. And this mental model is unique and individual to every student, and it might have some things that are wrong, right? As we're learning, we might misunderstand, for instance, how the electrons exactly are rotating around the nucleus. And in science education, they distinguish between the mental model, which is the student's individual understanding of how something works, and the conceptual model, which is the scientific consensus of how the atom actually works. And so as education, in education, we're obviously interested in helping students develop their individual mental models to become closer and closer to the scientifically accepted conceptual model. But mental models are also studied in design, perhaps most famously by Don Norman, who did a series of very seminal experiments on how people thought calculators worked. And so, Individuals who were using the calculator had their individual personal mental model of how the calculator worked. And I, for one, can attest that when using calculators, I often didn't quite understand what the clear button was meant to do or how it worked with caching. And so oftentimes when I was going to start a new calculation, I would hit the clear button three, four, maybe even five times to make sure that I had fully flushed out the memory. Of course, this betrays a lack of understanding of how the clear button actually works on calculators. And again, in design, we distinguish the mental model, which is the individual's understanding of how something works, from the conceptual model, which in this case comes from the designer or engineer who has a really good understanding of exactly how the calculator does work. Don Norman, in his research, found that mental models are incomplete and limited, that they're unstable and unscientific or often superstitious about things, but they're also parsimonious and they lack firm boundaries, so we're always drawing on our experiences of similar devices. Now, this kind of paints a bad picture of mental models, but actually they're incredibly useful. They're the way that we interact with an incredibly complex environment. And mental models value utility over accuracy. As a calculator user, I don't have to perfectly understand how a calculator works in order to use it in a way that's extremely functional. Now, in our work, we're interested in mental models of AI agents. We think studying mental models of AI agents is incredibly important, especially as AI agents and AI systems are starting to be used in really high-stakes environments, like in medical decision-making or policing or hiring decisions. And of course, the people who are interacting with these systems have mental models of the systems they're interacting with, and as, like all mental models, they probably have some inaccuracies about them. So understanding how people develop these mental models and where they fall short is a really important part of figuring out how AI systems are going to be used in the world. Now, we put the image of the AI agent in the middle um, of the science mental models and the design mental models because there are some distinct differences. The conceptual models in science come from discovery, right? They come from research, and actually they can change over time. So our conceptual model of how the atom works has changed over time. That's a little bit different than in design, where we're creating the artifacts that we're studying. And so as a designer or an engineer, we probably have a very solid understanding of how a calculator works from the fact that we built it. AI agents are somewhere in between, we argue, because on one hand, yes, we build the AI agents ourselves, but there's also a little bit of discovery involved in understanding how it actually behaves. And we'll get back to this in a second. Okay, so we wanted to study mental models, and if we want to study mental models of AI agents, we're going to need an AI agent that we're going to study. So we decided to use an AI agent that would play a game. Games are a long-standing testbed for AI systems, and the particular game we picked has some really nice features. So let me go over how this game works. It's a two-player word guessing game. One player has a secret word in their head that they're trying to get the other player to guess, and they give a series of one word hints. So for instance, they might give you the hint salad, and you think, okay, maybe they're trying to get me to guess the word lettuce. If that's not right, they just, they can give another hint. So now their hint might be red. You go, okay, salad, red, maybe they mean radish. 
If it's still incorrect, we get more hints. Now they give the hint fruit and you go, oh, I get it. Salad, red fruit, they must be thinking of tomato. And then if you win, a dialog box pops up and says you win. Yes, the target word was tomato. One thing that's important to note is this is a collaborative game. So winning is the same for both players. They both have the same goals, which means we don't have to deal with any of the deception issues that come with other kinds of games. But another important point is this is really a game about developing mental models. It's really about understanding what your partner is thinking. So we thought it was a really good test bed to start to probe how people develop mental models. So this is how the gameplay works. Next, I want to show you how the AI agent that we developed works to play this game. OK, so essentially, our AI agent is a trained neural network. We call it WordBot. We don't really have time to go into all the specific details of the architecture. But suffice to say, it has two main inputs. It has the game state, which is all the information about the game so far. So it would include the hidden word if it's giving hints, the previous guesses for this particular game, and any previous hints for this particular game. And then it also takes as input a bunch of information from a knowledge base. Uh, we use ConceptNet, which is essentially a large knowledge base of common sense information. Based on these inputs, the AI agent outputs what it thinks the next hint should be. This AI system is trained in a reinforcement learning context, so actually, technically, we have one AI agent that plays as the hint giver and one that plays as the guesser, but for the rest of this talk, we're just going to talk about the AI agent as the hint giver. Now, going back to this idea of how exactly do we develop conceptual models of AI agents, we developed this model so we had a really in-depth understanding of exactly how it worked, how it was trained, the data it was trained on, etc. But still, we had to do a bunch of analysis to really understand its behavior, because sometimes we couldn't predict how it would behave purely from the design of the system. So to give you an example of that, I want to talk about a subset of words that the AI agent tended to give pretty bad hints on, which was city names. And so if we look at the example of Paris, it gave pretty bad hints. But you might think that this is because it just doesn't have enough information about Paris. Maybe it's not available in the knowledge base or in the training data. But actually, it does have a lot of really good information about Paris. This is just a small subset, but it knows that it has the Eiffel Tower and the Louvre, that it has lots of cafes, that it's in France. So this is plenty of good information for lots of good hints. However, if we look at the hints given, they're pretty terrible. They're at best misleading, and at worst, they're, they're very confusing. So what we want to point out here is that in order to study mental models, we have to first understand the conceptual model. And in AI agents, this takes a little bit of the designer approach, where we have to understand how it was built, but also a little bit of the scientific approach, where we have to discover how it behaves through analysis. So once we developed a really good conceptual model of our AI agent, we ran two studies to try to understand how people were developing mental models of how it worked. The first study was a small-scale think-aloud study we brought participants into the lab and we watched them play a number of games with the AI agent, asking them to think aloud through their process. And then we did semi-structured interviews with them. So we collected a lot of qualitative data about how people were thinking about the AI agent. We used all this qualitative data to do a thematic analysis, which resulted in 10 emergent themes that we coded all the transcripts with. We don't have time to go into all 10 themes in this talk. We encourage you to read the paper. But we'll just talk about one of the most prevalent ones, which had to do with anomalies and distress. This was when the AI agent did something unexpected, and the participant remarked upon the fact that something unexpected happened and how they responded to it. There seemed to be two main types of responses. On one hand, some people would respond to something unexpected by saying, wow, I'm so stupid because I don't understand why the AI agent did this thing. For instance, give a hint that didn't make sense. On the other hand, some people responded by saying the AI was so stupid that it might be broken or making a mistake because it did something that didn't seem to make any sense. What's interesting is that sometimes both of these responses were incorrect. Sometimes the people who felt like they were stupid were actually experiencing the AI agent doing something that didn't make any sense. On the other hand, sometimes people who were quick to blame the AI agent for making a mistake actually weren't understanding the logic it was using to provide a hint. For instance, sometimes the AI agent provided antonym hints, which at first seemed confusing, but upon reflection was an okay strategy to take. And it was in the face of these anomalies that people were most likely to reflect on and sometimes revise their mental models. And so one of the findings of this study was that people are most likely to change their mental models when something unexpected happens. 
The other thing that came out of this study was a framework for how people generally were thinking about how the AI agent worked. And this framework has three main components. The first is global behavior. For instance, people wondered if the AI agent was learning from their, the past games and customizing it to them personally. The second part is knowledge distribution. People seem to be aware that it's possible that the AI agent would know more about food than pop culture, or more about certain places than others. The third part is local behavior, which had to do with how it made an individual decision, why it gave a single hint. Now, these three categories have very specific interpretations for our particular AI agent, but we actually think it's a really useful framework for all kinds of different AI systems. For instance, let's say you have a sentence classification tool. Global behavior might be whether or not it's continually learning from new examples. Knowledge distribution might be if it's equally accurate on all types of sentence inputs. And local behavior might have to do with what features of the sentence it's most paying attention to when it makes a single classification. Using this framework, we were able to develop a survey that could probe people's mental models of the AI system. And this allowed us to do a large scale online study where we could have people play the game online and fill out this survey so we didn't have to bring a ton of participants into the lab. For this study, we recruited over 100 participants from Amazon Mechanical Turk and collected a bunch of demographic data to make sure that none of our findings were confounded by anything like age or education level. We looked at two main variables in this study. The first was the number of games played. We hypothesized that more, if they had played more games, they would have more time to develop a better mental model of the system. The second variable was win rate. We suspected that people who won the game more often would have more accurate mental models, and that this would allow us to probe what was getting those people to those accurate mental models. When we looked at the results, we didn't find any significant differences between the number of games played. This is perhaps because the difference simply wasn't large enough, and in future work, we're interested in looking at far more games played, for instance, 30, 50, or even 100 games played, perhaps over many days where people could really start to adjust and learn from the gameplay. However, we did see some significant differences when we looked at the win rate. So to look at the win rate, we wanted to compare people who won the game most often to those who lost the game most often. So we split everyone up into two categories, the winners who won more often and the losers who lost more often. So in this table, I'm going to go over just some of our survey questions. And each survey question posed a question about what they thought the AI agent knew or could do, and then they answered it on a Likert scale. So we're also showing here what we think a correct answer would be based on a strong understanding or the conceptual model of the AI agent. So first I want to show the results for knowledge distribution. Um, as you can see here, there actually weren't any significant differences between winners and losers about um, over the knowledge distribution. This is likely because their, in the number of games that they played, they simply didn't have enough exposure to all the different kinds of categories of words. But we do see that people were sensitive um, to the overall trend that the AI agent did know more about some things than others. So this just goes to show that people really were sensitive to the things that were going on with the AI agent, and it wasn't just kind of random where people were totally making up their answers. However, when we looked at global behavior, we did see some differences. So these were two questions we posed um, about uh, attributes or abilities of the AI agent that the AI agent actually did not have. And we found that the winners were more likely to say that the AI agent didn't have or wasn't able to do those things than the losers. So the losers were overestimating the AI agent's abilities. But actually in both cases, people were overestimating the abilities. The winners were just more likely to be closer to the real answer. We did some follow-up surveys to try to understand exactly why this was, and losers were likely to say, um, to actually acknowledge that they didn't have evidence for their claims. So they would say, you know, I didn't see any evidence that it adjusted its hints, but I believe that that's something it should be able to do. So this was a pretty interesting um, result, even though we didn't exactly see what was encouraging accurate mental models, we did start to see the seeds of why people had inaccuracies. So to quickly summarize, we found that people were most likely to develop and improve their mental models when responding to something unexpected that the AI agent did. And we saw that people tended to overestimate their, the AI agent's abilities, even in the face of no evidence. 
want to thank everyone for listening to this talk. There's a demo of the system online, and I want to say thanks again to the big, amazing team that worked on this with me.